I want to start this video with an apology. Because in my last video, I made a statement that made several people angry, hurt, confused. I've received many direct messages, letters, visits to my home. My own family has ostracized me and I can't leave the house without feeling like there's eyes on me, judging me. And so I need to correct a misstep because I did, miss, uh, I did misspeak. Misspeak, is that a word? I don't know. I'll apologize for that later. But it's affected the way that I sleep. It's affected the way that I eat. I actually considered eating at Arby's yesterday, which no one in their right mind would actually consider eating at Arby's. And so I know that it's affecting my psyche. Um, I haven't shaved since this morning and look at me, it's obviously affecting me physically. So it is something that needs to be out and cleared in the air. Um, I made a statement that Jurassic Park 2 was better than Jurassic Park 1. And for that, I apologize. I was wrong. Obviously, I underestimated the effect that that movie had on an, an entire generation. I neglected the gymnastics raptor scene and how it almost destroyed an entire man's career. I'm speaking of Steven Spielberg, of course, as a respected director. And so for that, I'm sorry. In this era of cancel culture, I feel it is my duty to come clean. And so I apologize. I, I pray that you would accept my apology and we can move forward from here. So with that being said, you ever notice how cancel culture is just all around us? People are being canceled for all sorts of things. But the rules of cancel culture are, are a little bit odd. Uh, there is, it seems like, just a few things that if you speak on them wrongly, you can be canceled. And I think the church should get into the game of cancel culture in one area. And I've saved this topic for last because it's very near and dear to the church, to God's heart, to my heart. And it is the topic of abortion. I think the church should be in the business of canceling abortion. And I know that all of you agree with me. If you're a Christian, you agree, right? It is an abomination. And I think that we'll be judged for it as a nation for allowing it. Um, approximately 24 humans are aborted each day in America. That's a lot of people. One in four women in the U.S. will have an abortion by age 40. But apart from that, it's, it stems out. There's an attack on our children. There's an attack on, on the, the lives of the unborn, but there's also an attack on those that have been born because an estimated 10 million children are being victimized by trafficking right now worldwide. 10 million children are being affected by that. So we're killing 2,400 children a day. 10 million children are being affected by trafficking. And even more children in America and throughout the world are being affected by indoctrination. I saw a change.org petition about a Netflix documentary that, or a Netflix uh, show that's coming out called Cuties. And it sexualizes young girls at the age of 10 and 11 years old. It's all about a, a, a gang of girls that are into twerking. And uh, the poster that they posted out there uh, for the cover of this show was disgusting, and so people were outraged. So there's three things in the facet of the attack on our children. Obviously, abortion, uh, sexualization of children, and then the trafficking, sex trafficking of children. And, and the church should be concerned with this. If there's anything that we should be concerned with canceling, this should be at the top of our list. God hates it. God has not designed it this way. It says in uh, Psalm 127.3, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Uh, just the other night, Pastor Bob was speaking on idol worship uh, from the Ten Commandments, and he said something really profound. He said, in biblical times, we sacrificed to God Moloch. Now, in our modern times, we sacrifice our children to the God of convenience. I think that's true. We are sacrificing our children, and more than just in, in abortion, uh, their minds, their health, 
and um, it needs to stop. And so the question inevitably raises, what can I do? I talk about what, with my wife all the time after we hear a message on abortion or the sexualization of kids. And you feel somewhat helpless because it's such a large thing to tackle. And so you ask the question, what can I do? And inevitably, one of two answers comes forward as the top two answers. Number one is pray, which absolutely we should pray. We should pray to pull ourselves closer to God's heart on the issue. We don't pray to pull God our way. We pray to pull ourselves God's way. And the closer we get to God's heart about the issue, uh, the closer we get to resolving the issue. And so, yeah, we do need to pray. But the second one is always this. You need to get out there and vote. Or you need to write your senator. Or write your congressman. Or you need to sign this petition. Now, those are all good things. But my Bible says in Romans 12, 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with good. And so our aim should be to conquer evil and to do it by conquering evil with good. And we have in our arsenal power to do that. You know, I was uh, driving to church about a year ago in my old Toyota. It was a Camry, had about 200,000 miles on it. So it was only a matter of time before it broke down or something happened to it. Well, the battery light came on and I ignored it because I'm like, eh, pff, it's just a light. It's probably a malfunction. I don't have time to deal with this. Well, eventually, uh, I lost power to my car and it broke down and I had to have it towed. And I bought a new battery and put a new battery in. Cool. Battery light went off. We're good. Started driving again. Battery light came on again. I thought, huh, that's weird. Must be a faulty battery light. No, that battery died on the freeway. And so luckily I got off at McKinley Avenue in Corona, California. And just by the grace of God, there was an auto zone right at the exit. And it, it was it was fortuitous. I rolled right into the parking lot and I was able to buy, yes, another battery. So I bought another battery, put it in the car. Battery light came on again. And so I finally I Googled it because I don't know anything about cars. As you can tell by the way I'm dressed, I don't know anything about cars. Uh, I'm a musician through and through. And there's a rule. You can't be handy in a musician. So I Googled it. Turns out it wasn't the battery problem. It was the alternator that was charging the battery. And so if our only approach as Christians is to vote and write our senators, we are essentially changing a battery in a car that needs a new alternator. We need to focus on where the real power comes from. The alternator charges the battery and provides power to that battery and keeps that car running. And so we need to focus on the real issue. Where does the power come from? And in Romans 1, 6, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power at work of God, saving everyone who believes. There's power in the gospel. Now, we hear this as the, the solve for many issues. Like, we, we just need to preach the gospel. We need to live the gospel. And in some respects, it seems esoteric. It's like the gospel. Oh, I know the gospel. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, God created you for a purpose and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he loves you and he wants to reconcile you to him. We know the gospel, but the gospel is so much more than just what we share to get people to salvation. It is the healing for our world through Christ. And so, yes, the power of the gospel can help us to end abortion, can help us to end child sex trafficking, can help us to end the sexualization of children. But it takes the carriers of that power, the carriers of that gospel, to step in and to step up. And so in that question, what can I do? I prayed and God's been really revealing things to me on my own heart that I need to do. I'm preaching this message to myself first, and then hopefully others will be blessed by it. And so I want to give you three things that I believe we can do to save our children. We see that a lot, save our children. It's not going to be done in sharing a meme. It's not going to be done in signing a petition. It's not going to be done in donating money. It's going to be done to the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel and God's 
life-changing power. And so I'm going to give you three things that I feel like we can do, practical steps that we can take as Christians. They're not going to be easy. Uh, They're going to take sacrifice, but they are well worth trying. And so here they are. Number one is disrupt the supply. Number two is deprive the reward. And number three is deplete the demand. So disrupt the supply, deprive the reward, deplete the demand. So let's start with disrupt the supply. So let's start with some some statistics, right? As of 2014, did you know that 86% of women who have abortions are unmarried? So a large portion of women who are having abortions are not married. So they're having pregnancies out of wedlock. And you hear this a lot, you know, well, what about cases of rape and incest and all these things? Well, did you know that less than 1% of abortions are due to cases of rape? So the large problem in women becoming pregnant is out of wedlock. And I believe that uh, men need to step up. First, Christian men need to step up. Did you know that girls without fathers in the home are eight times more likely to experience teen pregnancy? And teen pregnancies account for a lot of abortions. So... We need to step up as men of God, and we need to commit. So my generation, the millennial generation, is getting married at a much less rate than the generation previous. And specifically, Christian millennials are opting for uh, being single. And I think that we need to be careful. Yes, if God has called you to be single, be single. If, if God has called you to be married, be married. But don't live in the in-between. Well, I'm going to date a little bit. I'm going to experience life a little bit. Uh, I'm going to, you know, be with this girl for three years, four years, five years. He's like, hey, commit to that woman. We need more godly fathers. We need more godly husbands. Um, and then also, if you're a godly man, step in the gap for people who are lacking godly fathers. I think a fatherly figure, even if you're not in the home, can make a world of difference in the life of uh, the mothers, in the life of the women who are trying to carry this baby to full term. Imagine if you messed up, if you're a woman and you messed up and you got pregnant out of wedlock, the decision that you have to face is like, I don't have the support system. I don't have a father. And so inevitably these women choose the route of abortion. But if they had godly men in their lives that they, they knew they could rely on to walk with them and to help raise this, this child, how different would their decision be? So, and it seems interesting that in the absence of fathers, we're starting to export fatherhood, right? There's a many young men who are now without fathers, and so they find father figures in other things like sports players, or celebrities. Well, if you look at like the NBA alone, uh, I saw an article the other day that listed all the NBA players with more baby mamas than they had uh, playoff rings. Uh, One of them, uh, Dwight Howard, had eight kids with eight women. And so now we're exporting fatherly figures to people who are not exemplifying uh, fatherly behaviors. And so I think we need to disrupt the supply. And I think men can step in to the gap to help do that. Number two, we need to deprive the reward. Deprive the reward. So in Romans 1, 30 through 2, 1, I want to read it to you. It says this. It's speaking, Paul speaking of sin in the world. He says, they keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. That's, that's cold-blooded right there. And it's not as if they don't know any better. They know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face, and they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. So again, I said we need to deprive the reward. You know, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. The American Academy of Pediatrics reports that in the United States, 42% of children between the ages 10 and 17 have viewed pornography online. Between the ages of 10 and 17, that's my daughter's age. 
I cannot imagine her being exposed to something as damaging as that. But it's happening. 42% of our kids are, are experiencing this. A recent poll of 2000 teens found that nearly 75% uh, of these teens had received pornographic direct messages from strangers on social media, even with a private account. You know, some, some parents will be like, well, the account's private. Nobody can get to them. It's not true. They can. So my kids do not have social media. They're not looking at TikTok. They're not looking at Instagram. They're just not on there. And I want to deprive the reward. And I want to take it one step further. You know, it says here, you know, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. What is the best prize you can hand out to somebody for doing the worst thing best? I believe it's our money. It's our money, right? You know, it's interesting how many folks I saw share a change.org petition for Netflix to remove cuties from their platform. We were so mad that this was on their platform. And so are we depriving the reward by signing a petition? No, but would we be depriving the reward for Netflix if we withdrew our money from Netflix? Now there's a slippery slope there because if we start living our lives monastically, if we start living our lives, you know, asking, okay, what does Pepsi support? Oh, don't buy Pepsi. If we live our lives, oh, we have an AT&T phone, but AT&T donated this much money. We have to be careful. There is a slippery slope. But in the effort of keeping our kids pure, uh, I think it's a worthy cause to deprive the reward for those who are doing the worst things best. And when they're after our kids, that is the worst thing. And when they're doing it the best, we need to pull back. And it's going to take sacrifice on our own part. Because Paul says right there in verse 1 of chapter 2, you may think that you can, t- can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. You have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourselves. For you who judge others do the very same things. You know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way they should go, and when they are older, they will not depart from it. We confuse this sometimes. We think that Proverbs 22, 6 is a promise, but it's really a principle. And it can hurt us sometimes. It's like, well, I've trained them in the way of the Lord. I've taught them Bible studies and I've done all the things, but yet they still departed. I thought this was a promise from God. Well, no, it's not a promise. It's a principle. If you train them in the way they should go, when they get older, it will stay with them. They will know what is right in God's eyes. They'll still be accountable to it, but they'll know what's right. And so in the effort of training our children in the way they should go, what does it say to them when we tell them that sexualization of children is is bad, but we keep our Netflix account? And I'm speaking to myself because I have a Netflix account right now, and I've recently been just convicted in, in studying for this. Should I be canceling it? You know, should I be withdrawing my money? Where am I putting my time, my talent, and my treasure Where am I putting my reward? I think we need to deprive the reward because the the sooner we do that, if we dry up the well in which they go to, to draw their resources to create stuff like this, once it dries up, that stuff will dry up. And I think it has an effect on our children. So deprive the reward. The third one is deplete the demand. And this one is hitting me hard lately. And it's a hard one to really contend with, especially given my past, but I really feel the Lord convicting me of this. And so we need to deplete the demand. So we deprived the reward. Now we need to deplete the demand. And I think we can go to James chapter one, starting in verse 22. But before we do, uh, my son wakes up every morning. And for a while, he was asking for one of two things. He would wake up, good morning, dad. Hey, buddy, how's it going? He goes, can I watch a show? It's like, uh, no, you know you're not allowed to watch a show until after X, Y, and Z. Okay. Are you hungry? Yeah. I want ice cream. Can I have ice cream? Literally every morning. I want ice cream. I want ice cream. And it, it got to be kind of a pain. It's like, no, you cannot have ice cream in the morning. Although as an adult, not a bad idea. Anyway, so no, can't have ice cream in the morning. So one night we decide, hey, kids, you know, you ate well all day. Let's have ice cream. Let's get that vanilla ice cream from the freezer. So I go to the freezer. I know it's in there. I open it up. I can't find the vanilla ice cream. That's weird. I'm like, 
well, sorry, Brennan, there's no more ice cream. He goes, oh, hold on, runs to his bedroom, goes under his bed, pulls out a melted, disgusting box of ice cream. And he goes, here it is. And I was like, dude, you can't put ice cream under your bed. You can't just like, so I opened it up and showed it to him. And he's like, oh, it's gross. So what we had to do is stop buying ice cream ahead of time. And when we knew we wanted to have ice cream, we would buy it and then eat it that night because I knew that if it was in the house, it was in the freezer, he was going to go and grab it and, and take it and it was gonna be a disgusting mess. So all that to say, we need to deplete the demand. We need to remove the demand for abortion. We need to remove the demand for child sex, tra sex trafficking and sexualization of our kids. And so how do we do that? Well, James 2, 22 uh, through 27 is a great place to start. So I'm gonna read it to you. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. If Oh, and your religion is worthless. Here it is, verse 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Christians, we, we need to refuse to let the world corrupt us, but we need to look at what God says. What is pure religion? It's caring for orphans and widows in their distress. It's caring for the less fortunate. It's caring for those around us that uh, don't either have a voice or have a, a leg up. And it starts with the orphans. You know that there are 400,000 children in the foster care system in America? I looked it up. It's crazy. 400,000 kids without a home. 125,000 of those kids are ready to be adopted right now. They're just waiting for the right family to come along and say, here I am. To give you a little idea of how this can be solved, there are 344,000 Christian churches in the U.S. And I saw a statistic that was really hit home for me and has really convicted me. If one family from every church in America were to adopt one kid, there would be no more orphans in America. There would be no more orphans in America. If just one family from each church in America, you know, the average church size is a uh, hundred people roughly, which means, what is that? You know, 25 families. So one in 25 at the average size church, we have more than enough supply of families to deplete the demand for orphans. So how does this help? Well, 60 to 85% of children that are sex trafficked are from the foster care system. So if you want to see sex trafficking depleted drastically, take kids out of the foster care system. Adopt children. And that's from a HuffPost article. You know, the CDC says before Roe v. Wade, 19% of unmarried women chose adoption. 19% of unmarried women who were pregnant chose adoption. After Roe v. Wade, when abortion was made widely available, by 1980, that, uh, that statistic dropped to 2%. So we went from 19% of women saying, yeah, I'm going to carry this baby to term, give it up for adoption, before Roe v. Wade. After Roe v. Wade, we have only 2% of women choosing to carry to term and give up for adoption. By 2002, that dropped to 1%. In 2014, 18,000 kids were put up for adoption and 1 million kids were aborted. So what does this mean? Well, in a, in a, a Women's Health Issues article, they did a study and they talked to 956 women. And of those 956 women, they were talking about adoption versus abortion. And in the article, it says this, adoption was often ruled out because they felt it was not right for them because their partner would not be interested. 
because they had health reasons for not wanting to carry to term, but the main reason was because they believed there were already enough children in need of homes. So why add to the demand, right? Why add children to the system when there's so many children suffering? Yet Christians can solve that problem. And I'm speaking primarily to myself, like I said. Um, Regrettably, when I first got married, I got married at 18, so give me grace. Uh, At first, I told my wife, you know, maybe being married and free is is great. Like, I don't don't know that we need to have kids. Well, that changed. The Lord said, yeah, yeah, you do. And uh, you know that we were on birth control and we were that 0.1% that it didn't work for. And so we got pregnant by age 22. Uh, So after that, I was like, well, great. I said, I'll tell you one thing that I'll never do is I'm not going to do foster care or adoption. And I was leading with my own experience with the situation. So my parents adopted my sister, whom I love, and they adopted my brother from the foster care system, whom I love. And my experience through that was, it was very emotionally damaging in, in some ways. You know, it is not an easy road to do foster care. It is not an easy road to do foster care and, and, and adoption through foster care. Um, in the instance of my brother, I, I shared a little bit about him in, in the past video. Um, we found out he had HIV uh, later on in his life, and then he lost his battle with HIV. So that was hard for us. But even before that, we had him from 18 months to four years old. He you know, my brother, my parents were his parents. And uh, a, a relative came in and said, "Now nah, I'll take him back. And so they favored the relative. And so they took him out of our home, put him with the relative. Then the relative said, never mind, don't want him. Instead of placing him back in our home, the only home he really ever knew, the only parents and, and siblings he ever knew, they put him back in the foster care system. He ended up in a, in a group home. But my mom tracked him down after a month and brought him back to us. We got with the social worker and said, we fought for him and brought him home. And it was, it was a rough time because we, we brought him home and we learned that he was being abused. So there's a lot of emotional ups and downs. And so after I had my first kid, I was like, I'm not going to put my kid through that. And I'll admit it, I'll admittedly was just being selfish. I was being selfish. And the Lord has been really pressing on my heart lately to share on this issue because I, I believe that, number one, Christians, especially married Christians, uh, we're commanded to be fruitful and multiply. And so we should be having kids. You know, the, the Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples. You can literally make disciples by having kids. So uh, train a child in the way they should go. You're making disciples right there. So I, I do believe that we're commanded to, to have children. And I, I realize this is a sensitive subject. Some folks are unable to have children. Um, we are challenged to take care of the orphans by the Lord. And I think that this issue alone can dry up so much of the things that we're fighting for and shouting about on social media. We don't need to write a red X on our hands and post a picture. We don't need to sign a petition when we have the solve right here. Take care of the orphans. And so I'll challenge you and... Again, I don't want to be the Holy Spirit in your life, um, but the Holy Spirit is definitely convicting my own life, and we're, we're taking steps to, um, to move in this direction um, to adopt some kids. And I want to challenge you. Maybe you are a Christian, and you've had your kids. Maybe your kids are grown, and you're wondering how you can jump in the game to solve this issue of child sex trafficking, to deplete the demand for abortions, to deprive the reward, to disrupt the supply, uh, here's a place to start. And so, again, we need to take care of what's on God's heart so that He can take care of what is on our heart. We need to make sure that we're leading with prayer. And yeah, you got to get out there and vote. But don't rely on legislation to solve this problem when God has given uh, the call to the church to do it. God bless you guys.